Welcome to episode 128 of the Clive Barker podcast. We, uh, we always love to have special guests on the show. Today we have a real treat. Joining us is composer Chris Velasco, who scored the 2007 game Clive Barker's Jericho in a record three weeks, as well as a 2014 Made Fire motion comic, The Book of Blood. And he was also the curator for last July's Wonder Common, a solo exhibit of Clive Barker art. But his career has been extremely prolific. He has also composed music for loads of AAA games like Assassin's Creed Unity, Overwatch, Battleborn, the Borderlands series, God of War, and many others, as well as TV and short films. Recently, he scored an entire season for Hulu's show Freakish, uh, Battleborn's DLC Atticus and the Thrall Rebellion, and he has also collaborated with Chet Czar for his exhibit at the Copro Gallery in Santa Monica, Dystopia. So it's a pleasure to welcome to the show Chris Velasco. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Hey, guys. Good. Thanks for having me. It's, it's, it's wonderful to have you because uh, we, we've been playing um, Clive Barker's Jericho. In fact, Ryan has been doing a video review about the game. And, uh, and one of the things that we came up with was it would be great to be able to talk to the, uh, to the soundtrack composer. So here we are. Yeah, thanks. It was, it was, you know, it was the first time I worked with Clive, so really a special project for me. So how did that come about? Uh, well... Man, there's a real long story of how I <laughs> live, and that's how it all initially came about. But I don't know if you want to hear the whole story or just about um, the game. Uh, oh, sure, whatever you're. Yeah, this is this is kind of a casual conversation, so you know whatever you're comfortable with. Okay. Um, so I grew up as a as a just a big fan of Clive, and uh, I used to collect a lot of books and I would go to book signings. So I, I met him, you know, first at a book signing. And this is before I even started studying music. Um, and then and then once I got into to music and composing, I was still going to these Clive Barker signings. And I started sending him, handing him, I should say, um, like a demo CD. And, you know, I'm, I hate to think what was on them now and what I was <laughs> <laughs> what I was leading with for Clive, but I'm sure it wasn't very good. Uh, but he was always just very like genuine and encouraging. And you know, I, I'd give him the CD and I'd say, you know, Clive, one day we're going to work together. And uh, yeah, he was, he said, all right, I hope we do. And, um, and so every, every year or two or whenever he'd have a new book come out and he'd do a signing for it. I'd show up again with an updated CD <laughs> and did this about three times. And then one day in my, uh, this old apartment I was living in, um, I get a, a phone call and it says, you know, blocked caller. And you know, I'm thinking like, Oh God, it's, you know, someone trying to sell me something or, or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and I almost didn't pick it up, but I, I clicked it over and you know, You've heard Clive's voice. You know he's got a very distinct gravelly. Oh yeah, yeah. You 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 couldn't not know it was Clive if you heard him say something. Um, so I pick up the phone. I say hello, and I hear that voice say, "Is this Chris Velasco?" And uh, I instantly knew who it was. And I I mean I almost like my legs almost buckled. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> that is awesome. And it yeah. says, you know, Chris, you've been talking about wanting to work with me for a number of years now, and and I've I've got this new video game, and I know you work in games now, and and I thought you'd be a perfect fit. So, you know, are you available, and would you like to to score my game? And that one was actually demonic. Oh yeah, I was going to ask about that. Um, and yeah, it was like best day of my life. I couldn't believe I went from, you know, like fanboy to now working with Clive Barker. Wow. And so that was, uh, I believe that was the first time I went to his house. He, he called me over. He said, let's, you know, let's chat about the project, listen to some music. I'll give you my thoughts. And, and so I went over to his house, down into his, his workshop, his big painting room. And, and he was working on, I don't know, a number of, like, large canvases all at once. And he kind of had his, you know, his clothes were all spattered with paint. And uh, he's chewing on a cigar, and uh, and he you know he says, "Hey Chris, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm I want to keep painting." And uh, and then he started 
pulling CDs out and playing them and and painting something that was, you know, possibly for Abra. Mm -hmm. uh, and we just listened to music and talked about the project and it, it was crazy. So that, that would have been a really cool game had it ever come out. <laughs> did, did you ever get a chance to do any of the music for Demonic or does that always come near the end? No, I never wrote a, a single note for it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know that I, the, the demos that we've seen don't have any any kind of musical score yet. Yeah. Or yeah, the footage, they, I guess. Yeah, they just, um, they canceled the game internally without telling Clive. And, and we, you know, we were having meetings at his house for three days and they were just, they're too chicken to say from day one. The oh, game man. Is, we're here to tell you it's canceled. They made Clive sit through, you know, four hour meetings about about this game. And he's getting all worked up and he's he's got this big tablet of paper out. He's he's drawing these ideas and and he's ripping them up and like crumpling them. I was like, oh, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um and uh and then yeah, third day they were wrapping up another like four hour meeting and Clive was like, All right, gentlemen, I gotta get back to work. Thank you so much. I'm really excited about this game. Like you know, I'm, I'm really pumped. I've been wanting to do another game for so long. And and that's when one of them finds like, uh, the game's not happening. Oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. And just totally screwed up. I, I couldn't believe it. It felt for me, and I'd only been on the project for three days. I felt like I just got kicked in the gut. Um, right. This was, you know, going to be my dream project. But, man, I can't even imagine uh, how pissed Clive must have been. Holy cow. Yeah, I, I bought an Xbox 360 for that game, and I kept on every day going to the website looking for updates, and it just wouldn't say anything. They, I don't think, I don't remember ever a time when they said it was canceled. It just kept on going and going, and, and there was no news. And you know yeah. what's funny is that the only footage that we can see of that game demo is in the background in a TV in the movie Gram Grandma's Boy. Yeah, and someone is playing demonic on on yeah. one of the TVs. Yeah, I a friend of mine was like an extra or something in that movie, and he wanted to go see it. And like, oh man, it doesn't look very good. But like, <laughs> and then they played some of. I didn't know that demonic was in it, and and I saw it, and that's right when I was supposed to be working on, it, you know, and I was kind of like sat up in my seat, like, oh my god, it's demonic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think in the movie they were playing it on an original Xbox, which doesn't really make any sense, but. <laughs> so uh one of your first soundtrack uh, uh big breaks was for Battlestar Galactica, right? But your so Jericho was your big solo project scoring an entire soundtrack, am I correct? Uh Oh, as a solo project maybe because I worked with a right another writing partner for many years. He, he who shall not be named. Okay. <laughs> right. But you, uh, it, what sort of, um, let me see. So um, nowadays, a lot of composers use, use digital platforms to compose their music. So how does software like Logic or Cubase support you during the composition process? Can you describe your digital audio workstation for our music nerd listeners? <laughs> Um, yeah, I just, I use Cubase. I have been ever since I started composing and you, um, I'm always working. So it's up right now, but uh -huh. you know, with the two, I can't show you what's on the screen because it's in for an mm -hmm. project and maybe somebody mm -hmm. could. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No problem. Uh, but so I just put it on horn. So. <laughs> You know, sounds like a horn. Um, and switch over to the cellos and basses. Ooh, creepy. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so yeah, I've just got a whole template set up with every member of the orchestra, every articulation that they can play, and um, that, and choir, and piano, and um, percussion, and I just, uh, you know, switch between the, the sounds and, and play, record everything in myself and go back in and 
tidy up the, the MIDI files and, mm -hmm. um, and off it goes. That's fantastic. But for Jericho, you actually got to work with a choir of about 30 voices. Uh, I think you recorded it at Skywalker Sound. Uh, what, yep, that's true. Yeah. Uh, you work with Leslie Ann Jones, a multi-Grammy award-winning engineer. How, how was that experience like? Uh, Leslie is awesome. I've actually recorded maybe like eight or nine times up there. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, Leslie is one of the, the coolest people I know. She's she's great. She's a great person and she's a great engineer, of course. Amazing. Uh, did you get to see any gameplay of the game, uh, Jericho, as you were composing or were you just given concept art? Um, no, I could actually play the game because um, it was so late in the process. Mm -hmm. I actually it, replaced another composer on this game. Oh. We didn't hold long, how did I get on board Jericho? But um, when I did, it was because Clive again had personally hired me to score this game. And, uh, and then the company that was making it decided that they didn't want me and they were gonna use somebody else and just not tell Clive. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> And then at the very end of production, they, um, the game developers had a meeting at, at Clive's house to go over it and see what he thought of the game. Are there any changes you want to make before it's you know too late? And he made he had some notes, and then he said, "And but what is this? You know, what is this music I'm listening to?" He said, "Oh, well, that's the score." And he said, "This is what Chris Velasco wrote." And um, and they said, "Well." We didn't hire Chris. We <laughs> no. this meeting, but I know two people that were, and they both uh, said that that Clive like flew into a rage, <laughs> oh, and, and told them that if they didn't call me, and if I wasn't hired to rescore the whole game in the next forty eight hours, he was taking his name off the project. Oh um, wow! Yeah. Uh, so that is the one and only time I've had my own, you know, eight hundred pound gorilla in the room. Yeah. Oh, that must be that must be something to have a Clive Barker for a champion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. That's why. Well, that's why I only had three weeks to score the whole game. Oh. Um, Is it typical and, though that you get to play the game while you're you know to while you're coming up with the score, or do you usually have to kind of use your imagination and look at concept art? Yeah, the, the latter. Okay. I, I rarely. Well, it seems um, like it shows because the 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 music really kind of flows well with the game. Um. Well, yeah, that's that's the idea, and then hopefully we've I've uh, written it in a way that that the, can be easily implemented to actually do that. Uh, half the work is, you know, the audio engineer um, implementing the the score so that it it makes the game feel seamless. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, the fact that you mentioned there was a previous soundtrack for uh, Jericho kind of flows into my next question that I had was that temp score has always pretty much been present in movies. Uh, is there an equivalent in game composing? Because I see the need for it in the editing process for film, because most films nowadays are practically cut to the music. Um, mm -hmm. But for games, this doesn't seem like, the, seems like the mechanic of the game is different. And so... Um, they tend to use different techniques for uh, game composition, like uh, looping the same music or making music that's that can be put on the loop or something. Um, so yeah, my my question is: Do games have temp score, or usually it's just go into composition and make the the score? Yeah, there's they don't really have a temp score because you know, like you were talking about it, it's not um, the game isn't cut to music at all, right? Right. Uh, uh, since and being nonlinear, it's it's tough to to temp in music for a game as well. Uh, but I usually do get a, a list of here's what we like, here's what we're listening to while we're making the game, kind of thing, and um, and I'll just kind of use that as a as a basic template of of the direction I should be going. Awesome, awesome. Um, so. What sort of notes did Clive give to you when you were composing Jericho? We just played, uh, again, had another listening session at his house, 
and he just played me a lot of music that he liked and he, and he told me a bit about the story and he, um, and we talked about how it had kind of religious connotations to it. And, and so I thought, Oh, but, you know, you got to have the choir singing in Latin if uh, mm. doing that. And, and, you know, with only a couple weeks or whatever to score the score, mix and deliver the game. Um, there was really no time to have a, a recording session, but I just, I really wanted that choir. And when I, <laughs> I guess the company had been told, um, don't piss Clive off. Like just whatever Chris wants, just let him have it. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> and I didn't yeah. do that until afterwards, uh, or I would have asked for a, a whole orchestra, but, but I asked if we could get the money to do a choir. And uh, yeah, they just like so quickly said, yes, that sounds great. Uh, oh, wow. So, yeah, I I actually started writing the, the whole score. We did this recording very soon in the process um, where I just recorded them doing a lot of long chords and a lot of kind of aleatoric, you know, weird clustery uh, stuff. And, and I did have a couple of melodies, so we recorded them doing that. Um, I had them re record some actual uh, Gregorian chants, and uh, then we just had them do weird effects and whispers and chanting. And um, so I got this whole big library of choir stuff, and then I used that as kind of the foundation to get started at writing. Oh wow! So you did that first? Yeah. So going back a little ways to, um, you were saying that you had first met Clive at a book signing. Do you remember which book? <laughs> no, I, I don't. I guess it, it might be, I don't know, one of the books of the arts. I, I can't. Okay. I don't, I, no, I, I can't remember. <laughs> I really love the firstborn theme uh, because it opens with, uh, I believe it's Greek. It, it, it's just this little child's voice singing Kyrie L.A. song, which means Lord have mercy. And it's just so creepy. It's just an excellent opening to the game. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, so if you've been playing it, you know that the firstborn, oh, have you seen the firstborn yet? Have you yeah. The game? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we've yeah. played the game it's several times. It's so old, I know yeah. that maybe I don't have to issue a spoiler alert. This no, video. no, it's okay. Uh, okay, so, you know, the firstborn was really like in the body of a child. Um, so I thought that that would be cool to get a boy soprano, um, just to, to sing his theme. It works so well because it's just the singular voice, almost no instruments. And it's, it, it goes towards the whole mythology of the firstborn because he was created first by God and he was a soulless creature. And then God locked him away in by himself in a little dimension. And that's almost like him singing Lord have mercy. And it's amazing, amazing opening for the game. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Thanks. It, it also had the uh, the duality of my my wife's daughter is named Kyrie, and oh. I was, you know, however much younger back then, how many years it's been, but uh, but brought her up to Skywalker too, and I, um, and so there was get seen as like check it out. I put your name in, in Clive Barker's Jericho, and I <laughs> that's thought, great. That was awesome, and she was just kind of like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's very cute um so in 2014 you scored the made fire motion comics adaptation of the, the story the book of blood um so this was again you were working with clyde barker how was that how did that opportunity came about i've just been in touch with them you know throughout the years after jericho and uh got to know his the new you know, vice president of Seraphim, Mark Miller. Yeah. yeah. So I got to know, you know, Mark very well. And um, yeah, they just called my, my agent up, I think, and said, we're doing this, this thing. We're doing motion comic of, of Books of Blood. There's going to be a comic for every single story in the Books of Blood, plus possibly a couple new ones that Clive was going to do. Ooh. Um, Hopefully that was okay to say. <laughs> oh yeah, no, yeah, it's been announced. It's been announced. Uh, so, yeah, they just called up and said, "Do you want to do it?" And I guess I do. <laughs> yeah, that's so amazing. I, 
if, yeah, if it's I, not I okay, say, I, go ahead. I love the Book of Blood soundtrack. It just added the perfect accompaniment to the visual experience. Uh, the subtle piano notes were very chilling. And the, the credits music box theme reminded me a little bit of Hellraiser. Um, th that climax with the choir at the end of the story just gave me goosebumps. I really enjoy that. And I hope to see more, uh, more of the motion comics come out. I think the next one that was announced at some point was the Midnight Meat Train. Uh, it's still... Uh, yeah, so we we already did that. And oh. um, there's a... We're hoping that it takes off again. Books of Blood kind of got put on hiatus. Mm -hmm. um, the format, you know, made fire. They just... It just wasn't moving enough. Like enough, not enough people were, were reading it. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's... Uh, I don't know. I, I haven't really heard too much about after that initial kind of um, all the cool things called motion comics like it seems like it kind of died down so I don't know we're we're exploring other options but I do think it's coming back out oh good yeah, yeah. so um, with these with the video games that you score do you uh, do you play through them after you get after the retail release comes out oh uh, I'm sorry I was reading a text that, that came. oh no uh, problem uh, do do you, you yeah do you read the do you play the games that you score after they oh, come yeah, out in retail? I always play the games, um, and if it, if it's good like like Jericho, um, I will play the whole thing. And you know some games get get an hour of gameplay or so. Oh yeah yeah, but I do play them all. In July, you curated and presented the Wonder Common uh, Clive Barker exhibit at Santa Monica's Copro Art Gallery, which is a place where you've you've done several, um, you've been involved in several events there. Um, so, how was that experience of curating a Clive Barker uh, exhibit and immersing yourself in such a prolific body of work? <laughs> um, you can't even believe how prolific it is until you actually <laughs> yeah. see the room. Um, it's it's kind of like, you know, the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark when they're pushing the, the Ark into that giant warehouse with just boxes. For yeah. That. Uh -huh. That's that's kind of what Clive's art room is like. You just, <laughs> it's yeah. just never being canvases, but all perfectly stacked up and labeled uh, with a, a QR code so that they could scan it and find out exactly like what it is and all the details. And um, But yeah, it's it's immense. And trying to pick out pieces for the show, um, that was that was super fun. But but oh my god, I just <laughs> I felt bad for the guy that had to put everything back because these things are gigantic and yeah. pull it out of the slot, and they're they're wedged in there so tight you don't you don't want to put it back in because I'm afraid that you know the paint you're gonna scrape it yeah. yeah. Uh, so I was just pulling things out and. And just leaving them out and stacking them out on the walls, and um, it was awesome. <laughs> uh, and you ended up doing some other stuff with other artists that uh, exhibit at the Copro Gallery. So I guess it, it became like a place that you like to work with. Yeah, I've been. Um, I got into collecting art uh, mm -hmm. a few years ago, and. Uh, just got to know a lot of the artists too, so the ones that are local, and just sort of getting involved in this art community. And um, yeah, this I, I I purchased a a few pieces from this Copro Gallery and got to know the uh, the guys that run it pretty well. And I asked them one uh, two years ago, said, "Hey, I've got this idea for a for an art show." called Roadside Attractions. And it's gonna be kind of like this dark carnival, like rolled into town and, um, you know, just featuring all this dark art. And it's gonna be eclectic. It's gonna be like 20 or 30 different artists. And there's no real theme other than something that you might find in this like dark roadside attraction. Um, and that show did really well and, and had a great turnout and so I've done a few of these shows with them now. And then I uh, actually called up uh, Mark Miller and I, I said, you know, I'm, I would love to do a solo Clive Barker art exhibit. There hasn't been one in a long time. 
and uh, and I know that I can get Copro Gallery to do it. Mm -hmm. They just they're like, that sounds awesome. Just go, just do it. Sure, and sure. That, <laughs> that's all it took. Yeah, but, and and you've recently also uh, did that uh, dystopia with Chet Zar, who worked in movies like Darkman, right? Uh, yeah, Chet is one of the artists I collect, and. Uh, and we become good friends, and uh, he had this really amazing solo show, Dystopia, like you said. And I mean, he even did a Kickstarter to to get it money to decorate the the outside of the of the gallery. There were like smokestacks, and there were creatures walking around, and there was a um, these like rusty pipes that were actually spewing out water, and and uh, wow. It, it was amazing. It was just, it was so crazy. But uh, I asked Chet if uh, he thought about having like a, some kind of ambient soundtrack to the whole thing. And, and he goes, oh yes, that would be awesome. And, and he was actually going to do it himself first because he plays, uh, he plays some instruments. And, and then like two days before the show, uh, he called me and he said, oh man, there's no way I don't have time to do it. Can you, can you do it? And I'm like, oh, yeah, there's only two days, but okay, I'll I'll do something. And how long do you want it to be? And I thought it was gonna be like a minute or two minutes. We just loop it. Um, he goes, I don't know, something like twenty minutes would be cool. And uh -huh. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Um, but I did do like that's a, a sweet track, yeah. And um, and we looped it, and and uh, it was cool. It really helped add to the atmosphere of of Chet's show. We're actually right, cool. talking about um, doing a project together that's like a disc with um, just with his art and that soundscape kind of going. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I think his, his fans would like it. Oh, yeah, for sure. I can see that you collect a lot of art because it's obvious when you look in the background of your camera, we can see a lot of amazing art, art on your walls. So it's very impressive stuff. Uh, I have one last question about the composing process. Um, games like Ubisoft's Assassin's Creed Unity uh, that you've done the soundtrack for the DLC, Dead Kings, they usually have more than one composer for the whole game, So, especially with the expansions and the like. Um, is there, a, is there a, how, do, how does the Ubisoft, for example, make this all work, you sound sounding unified uh does each composer do his own thing or do you guys listen to each other's uh work or or is it yeah i've i've done quite a few projects where there were a number of composers like right uh god of war always had like at least four composers yeah um borderlands had a, had a few uh and no, typically we don't listen to each other's music. <laughs> uh, I think everyone just wants to do their own thing. And, and um, you know, we get direction from the audio director. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of his job to make sure everything is, is unified if he's going to juggle, you know, a number of composers. But, you know, you just get your direction and you, you do uh, the best you can. And, um, and yeah, you know, at the end of the day, it all, it all sounds pretty good. Yeah. Uh, on uh, for Jericho, you released the Jericho soundtrack, or or someone released the Jericho soundtrack on iTunes, so people can can buy it and download it. Is that normal? Or did, does does that happen for other video game scores? Uh, yeah, I'd say most games are getting getting uh, iTunes releases these days. There's uh, you know it's such a popular medium, and and people really love the soundtracks now. And, I mean, there are concerts all over the world playing video game music. So, yeah, it kind of used to be few and far between for a, for a soundtrack to come out, but, but now it's, it's pretty common. Yeah, especially on Bandcamp, you can see a lot of composers that do uh, soundtracks for indie computer games, yeah. um, you know, like, like The Binding of Isaac or other games like that. They usually end up for sale on websites like Bandcamp yeah. or iTunes. Right. Um, so what upcoming projects are you working on right now that you can tell us about? I can talk about almost nothing. <laughs> That's okay. okay. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think. 
Oops. Um, no, uh, all I can talk, all I can say are things that have been announced already. And, and the only thing I, I think I've worked on that has been announced where they allow me to say I'm writing music for it, uh, is Volition's new game. Uh, the guys that did like Saints Row, mm -hmm. yeah, the game mm -hmm. is called Agents of Mayhem. Oh, Agents, of Mayhem. Agents of Mayhem. So, and that's been announced, but it's not out yet, right? Right. I, I don't know if it's out this year or next year, but um, it looks really cool. And and the music is fun. We recorded um, recorded that live also. Cool. Well, we'll watch out for that one. And Yeah. Uh, I, I wish I could tell you about some of the other stuff because um, I'm pretty excited about them, but Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll hear about it when it comes out. Yeah. So after Jericho, there was talk of a Jericho sequel, but then that all kind of sort of fizzled away. Was there, um, were you involved in that in any way or was there any, did, had you heard anything more, more than just what Clive Barker said in interviews? I think the game just didn't, just didn't sell well. Yeah. Um, I, a lot of people didn't care for it. I played it all the way through, and I actually thought it was a great game. I really liked it. I, I when I got done, I played it again on a higher difficulty, and then again on the last. So I I got all the thousand points on the <laughs> Xbox 360. Yeah, so that that's gonna be cool. Uh, we're gonna put part of this interview on the uh, the video review that Ryan is doing because you've recorded the whole game through, and you're gonna use that to make your video review. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Wow, you've got a recording of you playing all the way through. Yeah, well, I'm not going to make people watch all of that, but <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> some of it was me falling asleep and like bumping my face into a wall over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's funny. Um, all right, so Ryan, do you have any more questions? Uh, no, no, I think this was great. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Oh, you guys want to see Pinhead? Oh yeah. 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 All right. Hold on. Um, can I turn the camera around on this? I don't think so. Is that is that the iPad? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh my God! Oh, holy cow! That's it amazing. Is. Wait, so, let me. You can see how huge it is. Oh my God! That's from the 25th anniversary um, Hellbound Heart. Uh, yeah, they used that for the cover. Or 20th anniversary, I think. Right, that from 2006. I am very jealous. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. That's a really cool piece. Thank you so much for uh, giving us a peek of that amazing painting. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this by quoting what Clive Barker said about you once for Jericho. He said, It pleases me to no end to announce that once again, Chris Velasco will be providing the soundtrack to my worlds. Not only is Chris one of my favorite composers, he's one of my favorite people. His work on Jericho was unparalleled, and what he has brought to Books of Blood is, I assure you, nothing sort of astonishing. Prepare yourselves for an experience the likes of which you've never seen. This is what he said in 2014 when Made Fire's Book of Blood came out. That Clive, he's a nice guy. <laughs> he's awesome. Well, it's deserved, and we're looking forward to seeing more Clive Barker stuff with your, uh, with your music. Yeah, cool. Thank you. I, I hope there will be. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, and thank you so much. I hope you had a good time on the Clive Barker podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. You too. You can find the show notes for this page and lots of Clive Barker news and features at www.clivebarkercast.com. Leave comments there or get them directly into the podcast by clicking the Send Voicemail tab on the right. Please follow us on Twitter at BarkerCast or at Occupy Midian. Like us on Facebook and join the Occupy Midian Facebook group. You can listen on the site or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Libsyn, TuneIn, PocketCast, Google Play, and DoubleTwist. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Please take a couple of minutes to leave us a review on iTunes. It means the world to us and helps us spread the word about Clive Barker. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial fan site and podcast that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Films. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.